Welcome back. Another edition of the CBB Central Podcast coming to you the Sunday after draft day, June the 23rd. Brad, we you know expect to jump into the show, talk about the draft, but you know, late Friday night, early Saturday morning, things started happening, and, and all of a sudden we had you know pretty major realignment news in the world of college basketball um, on our hands, really broken by a, a small website I'd never heard of. They broke it Friday night, all of a sudden everybody's got it Saturday morning, and and what what was your reaction? UConn back to the Big East. I mean, it's 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 really crazy. And Val Ackerman, the Big East commissioner, she you know maybe two or three years ago, we, when 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 people would ask her on the record about realignment, you know, she would say like, oh, like we like the ten teams, we like the the uh, double round robin. Um, but then I think this year she kind of changed her her tune and mentioned, oh, if if we had an eleven school you know we can keep the double round robin um now that you know the big 10 broke the floodgates with the 20 game schedule the pac-12 is in and now now i mean you gotta you gotta stay with you know like like, like you can't be uh you can't be sitting you know sitting there idly by because two two less non-conference games you know for these two conferences the acc might already be following suit i'm not sure um but you know you can you can get left out in the cold. So it was it was a great move for the Big East to be proactive and grab this this really big brand that fits geographically. Um, it's a basketball school despite having a football team and being a big state school. Um, and I mean this probably the second best possible addition, like realistic addition for the Big East behind Gonzaga. And I'm not sure. Um, how realistic Gonzaga would be given the geographic constraints and if they could just be in it for men's and women's basketball or just men's basketball. Um, but I know there is something I saw where Fox is willing to pay the schools another $100 million if there's 12 teams, um, which I think could, could open the door for, for Gonzaga if they're still interested. I know, you know they, they almost moved to the Mountain West. Big East was discussed, but I think this is a, a great move for the Big East. Yeah, I mean, I thought... That was one of the reactions I really had right away, which you mentioned is the 20 game conference schedule. And, you know, I had a lot of people in the DMs. I had a lot of people asking me, oh, you know, what's going to happen? Um, you know, is, is, is the AAC going to try to add teams? Is, the, is this going to spur a big boost of realignment? Where I, 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 of course, had Sienna fans in my DMs. Yo, is, uh, could the A10 lose UMass and replace them with Sienna? And I was like, I think right now the target for conferences is either 11 or 14 plus. I think you either want to be at 11 or you want to go super conference style because you want the 20 game. If you're a high major program, high major conference, excuse me, you want the 20 game double round robin. And if you're a conference like the WCC um, or, or the A10 where you're, you're on the fringe of the at large bid, you want as many non con games as possible for now. But if it, if it kind of backfires and all of a sudden all these, these, these uh, leagues are doing 20, it might just be hard to fill the schedule. So those, those, those leagues might have to adapt and go big too. Um, so I thought that was my first real reaction other than good for UConn for prioritizing, prioritizing basketball over football. Um, I think a lot more schools need to do this. Um, especially I think like mountain West schools in particular, um, like if you're in New Mexico, you have great basketball tradition. Um, your football program is, is middling at best. Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you pouring money into FBS football? You're never going to win a championship. I mean, I could argue the same for, you know, San Diego State. Uh, even really, I mean, Boise State has so much tradition, it'd be hard to do it. But, like, it's proven that if you're not in the group of, if you're in the group of five, you're not winning a national championship. So unless your goal is to be in the next round of realignment and wind up at a high major, you should just prioritize basketball and try to be Gonzaga. And I think UConn, obviously, is such a big brand that, that, that saying what they're doing here is is just like that is that it's a little weird, but I think the idea stands of like UConn's best chance for athletic recognition is by being a very good basketball school, not by like getting to be like mostly making a bowl game in football. Yeah, and I don't. I I will preface this with I know literally nothing about college football. Like I I I don't know if I could name you two college football players. Um, says the uh, quarterback from Alabama. I'm not even sure if he's still there or not. The guy from Hawaii. Um, Tua. He is there. Okay. <laughs> he's the only one I know. 
But I do know that UConn was 1-11 last year. And I saw that their football program, I think, lost $8.7 million. Um, or that was their overall athletic department uh, deficit, and the football program lost $7 million. Those, those are the two numbers I saw. Um, so, I mean, if it's no longer sustainable, right, then I think it it would be wise to scrap it. It seems like a lot of people like it, even though like the fan support is not great. I think it's more of like a, if, if they win, the fans will, will show up and there's not a lot of college football in the Northeast. Um, and you know, it could be a big, big, big draw for students and stuff, but at least, you know, going independent or going, um, going to, I mean, I guess, I guess the Mac for, for football would just reduce travel costs to, to a point where it makes it a little more sustainable. And you know they could they could win more as an independent. They can kind of pick their own schedule and maybe get the six wins for the bowl game. Um, but yeah, it, it it doesn't really make sense because you know everyone says you know fo- football is king and stuff, um, and it gets and it brings in the most money um, for most of those teams. But like like you mentioned with like in New Mexico, like I don't know how good their football is nationally, but there's a lot more upward mobility in in, in basketball and it's a lot cheaper. Right. I mean, I think I think if you're a school where basketball is what you are known for and you do not have a foundation in football to build on, like UConn Stadium is 40 minutes from campus. Um, they have a much you know, a, a, a less passionate fan base. They've never they haven't won enough in, 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 in football. And obviously this year was really bad, but um, they've had they've had a few good years. But in, in general, UConn football has never been a power like at some point. You should be compete. It's okay to not be a football school, but even if you're a state, like a big state school, like it doesn't, like I don't think kids go like like in terms of like even just like a university reputation perspective. No one says I'm going to UConn and oh great, there's going to be football games. This is going to be hype. Like if you're if I'm like a if I'm a I'm a prospective student, like this is probably going way too deep than it needs to be. But if I'm a prospective student, I'm not like oh man, football UConn, that's going to be hype. I'm thinking like, okay, we have basketball games. That's our thing. Just like Providence would, just like Villanova would. And the cost differential of playing FCS football versus FBS football is so massive. I mean, UConn's a big state school. They'll still have some interest. I mean, I know like schools like Delaware uh, or FCS, they, they do fine in terms of their interest level in football. Um, well, UConn, state. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you talk about, I mean, there's, it's not like UConn football would die. They could be a very good FCS program. Like Villanova's terrific at football. Um, you know, Maine has a very good program. Like URI's FCS. Yeah, absolutely. Like I don't see why you can't be why you can be why you can't be FCS and D one and not be a very good basketball school. Just focus on basketball. You've got amazing women's basketball. You've got amazing um, potential in men's basketball. I believe. I mean, I, I just don't get why it's such a big deal with football. Um, I think, in just in terms of the ramifications of of college basketball, I think. It's probably one step closer towards, you know, super conferences. It's probably one. I don't think it's going to create this big realignment wave because, as I said, I think teams are gonna, uh, conferences are going to want to stick at eleven. Um, I've seen some interesting, you know, names that are on Buffalo. I think is an interesting name for the American, given where they are right now in football and basketball, um, both men's and women's basketball. They've been really good. Um, I think Buffalo is interesting. I think VCU as a basketball only would make sense. Um, and you know, there's some names out there. UMass has been tossed around over there in a bad spot timing wise because both programs have been bad. Um, but it'll be interesting. I think uh, in terms of the Big East, it helps the Big East. It gets another brand, as you said. It, it should bring in more money. Um, it should bring more notoriety because just, you know, MSG with UConn and Providence and St. John's and Seton Hall, like Villanova, that's good for, it's good for college basketball. So I think the Big East wins. The AAC, do you, how, do you think this tangibly hurts the AAC that much? So I think first, in terms of the AAC overall, I don't think that they should add a 12th team. Uh, I think, you know, you can, you know, especially a conference like the AAC that, that usually has a very distinct top and bottom, you know, sometimes a top, bottom, and middle. Um, and the bottom is just so bad that I understand the want to, like, gerrymander your unbalanced schedule. You know, it's like, oh, in, in the preseason we think, Memphis, Houston, Cincinnati, Wichita are the best. We'll make all those guys play each other twice, and we'll try to limit the times that they play Tulane and East Carolina um, and this year, like, SMU. But I think it's just easier, um, and I don't know. It's just 
I feel like the double round robin, even though it exposes everyone more to the bad teams, just, just and and the good teams, but you know, without the schedule gerrymandering, it absolutely exposes you more to bad teams. I feel like it still helps you, avo- you know, uh, you know, kind of maximize bids. Um, just just having that that guarantee of getting every every team on the home of the road. Um, if if you get a surprise team like a, like like this year, South Florida was a surprise team. You know, that's maybe like an extra opportunity um, for you winning at at South Florida, and then conversely for for South Florida to kind of build a resume, even though they were kind of count out uh, uh, before the season started. And if so, we go back the six or seven years in a Big East realignment. A lot of people thought that St. Louis was definitely definitely going to be one of the schools. Um, that would be invited to the Big East. They they had a very good team that year with like Rob Lowe, Jordy Arjet, um, Dwayne Evans. I think his name was the, the uh, kind of small ball power forward who was very good. Um, but you know they've they've since fallen off a cliff. And this year they were super talented, and and still were, uh, I think almost certainly sub 100 in Ken Palm. They were middle of the pack in the A10. Uh, so you know you, you mentioned with with the timing. Um, yeah, the timing's not right for UMass to be invited. But the timing could also be too right for a school like a Western Kentucky for a VCU. I saw Old Dominion thrown out um, where yeah, they, they might look promising now. Um, but, you know, after this crop of kids who are really good co- come through, you know, maybe the, their uh, program falls off and, they, and then you're stuck with a bottom feeder. I think the Big East got, got pretty fortunate to not, not have invited like a St. Louis um, with, with, with how the St. Louis program has ended up and then in terms of UConn I think this does hurt the, a- the AAC because UConn was probably the most recognizable brand um, you know, cer- certainly a upper, el- upper echelon brand in, in the conference and you know, this whole AAC Big East debate is, is so stupid because the people who, who want to make the argument that, that the AAC is better this is, this is the argument that I see 90% of the time well if you take out Villanova and if you take out the bottom of the AAC, the, a- the AAC is better. Oh, so you're going to take the best quality out of one conference and the worst quality out of the other and, and compare them? How does that make any sense? Right? Like, Tulane and ECU and Central Florida now and SMU now, they're, they're, they're part of the AAC. You're going to play there. You know, they're going to be on TV. That, you, you can't take them out of your conference in terms, in terms of evaluating them. Right, and that's what makes the AAC so unique. And, and I, when you were mentioning the double round robin, I was thinking, you know, in the Big East, for instance, going to the 20 game double round robin, it's never going to hurt you because you're playing 20 league games instead of 18. So you're adding like a road game against the even if you were trying to, you know, as you say, gerrymander the schedule, even if you're trying to, to rig it so that the top team doesn't ever have to play DePaul, doesn't have to play DePaul twice uh, if DePaul's the worst team in the league. Let's say you're doing that. Even if like you double, if you even if you're not the play to Paul, the Paul's still like a Q two road loss. Like they're, they, they're, they're, even in their worst times, they were still like a one top one hundred and fifty team. The AAC, what makes them so unique, and what makes me think the AAC isn't, if we look, I'm saying if we look fifteen years down the line, when like some of these TV deals expire and we're looking for money, I think the AAC doesn't exist, and it's because where's Tulane? Where's East Carolina? Like, where do those schools add value? Where does even, like, USF? They're not that good at football. They're not gonna, that good at basketball. There's going to be some schools that are going to be left out, partially because there's going to be some good schools that teams are, that, that, that people are going to want. You know, Cincinnati, could, could they jump to the Big Ten? Could they jump to um, the Big 12, even if the Big 12... I know the Big 12 is at 10 right now, so the Big 12 wants to get bigger of... Uh, Big Ten is at 14, so they're in position to expand a super conference and go 16 plus. The SEC, same way. Like the ability for these leagues to 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 take the top of this uh, of of the AAC is going to be very interesting. And I think the one school that's very interesting to monitor being potentially left out is Temple, just because of the regional fit. I mean, maybe they're a Big Ten play long term because their football is pretty solid. They play in a big bigger big stadium. Basketball has good history. Um, would you take Temple over Rutgers? I think you probably would, but I mean that's not really the debate at this point. If the Big Ten's becoming kind of a regional league um, into the Northeast, then Temple makes sense. But like, 
I think the general point being the AAC is not stable in the long, long term. And teams are going to get poached. And it's because of the strength of the top versus the strength of the bottom. And they're probably going to wind up. I, I saw it on Twitter. It was basically, you know, there's probably 80 teams that belong in, um, in, in the quote unquote power, power five for football that can be for a national football championship. And if football is going to continue to run D1, you're going to wind up with five conferences of 16 teams that, that run college football and then the rest in college basketball and how that shakes out for college basketball is another interesting topic. And quite frankly, I haven't flushed out my opinions enough on it to, to really say, it because I think it's 10 years down the line. It might be 15 down the line, but I think generally uh, the point that we're headed towards another big massive scale realignment um, is, is very relevant, especially now that uh, UConn has, has officially left the American for the Big East. Yeah, and I think another, another point on on UConn from a Big East perspective, right? So, so what are what are the pros of adding UConn, right? It's the brand, it's the fan base, it's you know more more exposure both both from from, from the cat uh, from from the casual fan and, and, and you know with with the fan base and and in the brand recognition of UConn, right? And those 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 are are, are the pros, and then keep, uh, keeping up with the twenty game. A scheduled trend by adding this 11 team. The cons of this are right, UConn's roster is okay, right? But they're probably not a tournament team this year. Um, and so while they've they've certainly recruited better of late, and, and they have Hurley in there, um, you know, I think when when you add a team, kind of like when the AAC adds Wichita State. That first year, I think you want that team that you're adding to be really good, right? Like, I don't think it's going to be great if the Big East adds UConn, and then UConn's first year they come in, like, ninth out of 11th. I don't – I mean, we'll still get all the eyeballs and the brand and everything, but I think from a national perspective, you know, that could land with a thud. And what what's a risk with any sort of, of upward realignment is, you know, if – if that team doesn't find its footing and it's just a a, a bottom feed of, you know, for for an extended period of time, you know that 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 might hurt the conference instead of adding to it. Now, I think I think UConn's gonna be fine. Um, while I, I don't think that they're a tournament team this year, I think next year, you know, if uh, Gilbert comes back for his fifth year, you have R.J. Cole, A. Kook, A. Kook, Josh Carlton's a senior, Gaffney and uh, Booknight in the backcourt, um, and then Sidney Wilson too. I mean, there's there's enough there, um, and they were they were they were recruited. At a high enough level in the in the AAC um, to, to to have success now with a little more stability, uh, but I think if you're a Big East fan, I think that the, you know while it, it would not be a good look nationally on on one hand if a UConn comes in and, and enters a league at the bottom. Conversely, if they come in and enter a league at the top, that could kind of discredit the whole league, right? Like, oh, UConn's come in to to a save the league. So it makes me think, you know, it might be good for the Big East, as, as contradictory as this sounds, for UConn to come in at the bottom where they, they get all the brand benefits, but still, like, see, like, like you know, the Big East is, is, is bigger than uh, UConn. I guess, I'm, I guess I'm a little confused by why it's concerning if UConn comes in and is immediately ninth. Because, like, UConn... Even the last five years when they've been bad. Well, I guess technically didn't they win a championship five years ago? No, that was longer than that. Uh, that was six. Six years six. ago. Yeah. Five, let's say, okay, the last five, five, five years. Five, yeah. The last five years they've been, you know, quote unquote bad. They've still been like between 60 and 120 in Ken Fong. Like they're not anchoring the league. They're not making the league worse. So, so it's not. I don't think. I don't think there's really that much negative because even if they come in at that level, they still have the potential to get right up. Get right up there. I don't think anyone would say that even two more years of this would all of a sudden mean now UConn has no potential to be a perennial tournament team again. I've seen the other take on the other hand, which was UConn coming back to the combined with Hurley being there will take all the recruits that the Big East schools have been winning with, and they'll dominate the Big East, which I also think is absurd. I don't think all of a sudden UConn can come in and take all the Cooley kids that that Cooley wants from mass rivals. Like I don't I don't think that's how it's going to work. Um, 
but I think it, I, I think it will truly test the theory that UConn couldn't recruit in the Northeast because of the American. I think that's wildly overplayed. I don't understand, given UConn has had McDonald's All-Americans like every single year, or at least close. I mean, they've had top 75 kids. Like they've, they've, they've recruited fine. Like the problem is not with the talent. It's been the Kevin Ollie's offense was stand around until five on the shot clock and ISO. But like, we'll see if that's the case. And if they start dominating the Northeast recruiting, it'll say something about the Big East. I mean, they got Akuk Akuk, what, you know, who was, I, I don't have the rings off the top of my head, but he was de- definitely a five star. He was definitely, you know, one of the top recruits. He did play for Mass Rivals. Jalen Adams played for Mass Rivals. Sidney Wilson's from New York. Book Knight, I think, is from New York. Um, so I mean, they've you know they've they've already gotten their their uh, fair fair share of Northeast guys. You know, already in, in the a- a- You know, Providence is only on three Mass Rivals guys since since Cooley's been there. Duke Reeves and National Langford. Um, you know, they've been getting guys from. In, Minus, which is not not a ton of overlap there with with a uh, UConn, and I know Villanova and uh, Georgetown recruit those areas too. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not worried about UConn like stealing recruits necessarily, because um, especially with, with with the emergence of of the Nepsack and kids coming all over to play in the Nepsack, um, New England schools can't just pick the top Nepsack players that they want. It, it, it's a very national national league, despite being new. New England focus. Right. I mean, I kind of thought it was absurd as well. I just thought it was another point that was being brought up that I thought you know, could be discussed. But it's interesting. I think I think UConn will do well. I think with Hurley there, especially a guy who is a Northeast guy, um, you know, his entire life, he's a Big East guy. Um, I think it really fits well. His fire will be fun. It, it will be really fun. I think hopefully St. John's can get going. St. John's really blew it. I thought uh, a lot of the discussion was really interesting about how um, – different different schools really took advantage of the new Big East and different schools didn't and St. John's certainly did not but we'll see if Mike Anderson can get them going but Seton Hall took a nice step forward since then Villanova obviously with the two championships Providence has gotten much better um since the Big East disintegrated originally um so we'll see what happens I think it's really exciting um just as a general college basketball fan it's one of those things that makes you smile that we're gonna have those matchups again um and yeah I'm sure sure Providence versus UConn will be be fun in in a year or two Brad yeah, because they were they were working on like a out of conference game, but now they get 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 each other twice. Absolutely. Well, we should move on because we can talk about this all day. Uh, we can talk about realignment. It's kind of fun stuff. It's it's all very speculative. It's a lot of stuff we enjoy talking about. But um, that's not the purpose of this podcast. We got a bunch to get to today. We got a transfer uh, in Ryan Woolridge to Gonzaga. Excuse me. Uh, that we will touch on at some point in the show. We'll also touch on. Um, Brad small forward rankings um, as we kind of worked through those since Andy Katz's rankings a couple weeks ago. Uh, but first, we wanted to just kind of give some general takeaways uh, from the NBA draft. It was Thursday, as expected. Zion number one, John Morant number two, R.J. Barrett number three. From there, um, not a ton of surprises. Um, you know, DeAndre Hunter goes four to the Hawks. Hawks giving up a lot to go up and get him. He was their guy. They also get Cam Reddish at ten. Um, Darius Garland goes at five to the Cavs, creating a dual backcourt. Um, Cavs also had a big day with Dylan Windler and Kevin Porter. Um, so they, they had a, they had a very busy draft for John Beeline to add some talent there. Um, the obviously other notable, um, falls were Brandon Clark into the twenties to Memphis and then Bull Bull at 44, all the way down there going to the Denver Nuggets. Brad, any, any big takeaways from, from a draft night that was pretty fun to follow? Okay. I think. I think Clark at 21, I think that's actually what I would consider like a good, a good landing spot for him. Cause I think, you know, we had touched on this last time, but you know, he's, he's going to be such like a specialist that, you know, him, him and Jaron Jackson are going to work really well together. Um, I mean, they're also probably going to bring back Valen Junis. Um, but like, it's going to be interesting because a lot of teams that have that bigger wing um, because wings are so scarce you know, like like your Paul George type, your Kevin Durant type. You know, I'll, a lot of teams want to play those guys at the four anyway. So, so that's why I think Clark's impact is is very very specific, and, and I'm and I'm fine with taking that kind of unique specific archetype um, in the late teens, you know, in the early twenties. But you know, I I saw him at number two on big boards. I saw him in the top five, and that's 
that's just ridiculous, right? Because you can't take someone with a number two pick who, who might not even be able to play one end of the floor uh, realistically. I mean, there, there are so many guys. Like, like, like one guy who the more this draft process evolved, the more that I liked uh, was, was Cody Martin. And, and that's because he, he had a very specific skill set, right? He's this big, big point guard who's like 6'7", but he can play probably one through four. Um, and you know, he can fit in in different ways depending on the lineup, kind of like a Sean Livingston type. Um, and I thought you know, he would be a great fit on, on a lot of different teams to come off their bench, you know, be, be like a 10th, 11th man in the second round. Um, so I think that's, that's more of where the unique archetypes um, should go. But Clark, you know, being so analytically awesome, and I'm certainly fine with him in that 15 to 22 range. And then one other thing I saw is, you know, people really didn't like the Jackson Hayes pick from New Orleans, saying that the league, you know, Jackson Hayes only shot three jump shots the whole year. The league's moving away. Like, how is he going to be on the floor? Yet they, they put Brandon Clark at number two, whose fit is even more specific than Jackson Hayes, who's this freak, um, you know, athlete, rim runner, lob target, you know, super high potential. Yeah, I mean, I'll buy that. I think the thing for me with, with Brandon Clark and I was disappointed once he started falling that he didn't land on a contender because I tweeted, um, you know, as much as him, him falling probably hurts him in terms of his, his money in his first contract, I think it could be for the best um, just because his you know, unique skill set could really contribute nicely to a contender. Like obviously not golden state. Uh, I don't think it's the right fit, but like, I think a lot of playoff teams could really use a guy who is an elite, elite defender, great rim protector, can guard multiple positions, um, slasher type, very athletic, out in transition type guy like Brandon Clark is. Um, but I do think, Brad, you might be underrating Clark just a bit, just because obviously the physical tools aren't there in terms of just your raw measurements. But, I mean, he is... You know, he he tested off the charts in terms of his athletics, athleticism, which played on the court. You know, too many times you see all these bouncy guys um, and you just don't see it on the court except when they're dunking. And I thought you saw it every time you watch Brandon Clark. I also think it's pretty fair to call Brandon Clark the second best player in college basketball this season. He's certainly top five for me. I think him, Zion, Cassius Winston, maybe RJ. Maybe John Morant would be at the top five for me in terms of guys this, who played this year. I think Brandon Clark was legitimately the second best player in college basketball. A lead elite defender, got to the rim, um, you know, finished at such a high level. I just don't. Th- I don't. I don't under. I don't think the Jordan Bell comparison gives Clark nearly enough credit. Um, so I think for that reason, I would have. I would have tapped, drafted him in the lottery. I would have been ten to fifteen. I thought which is more than fair for him. So for him to fall and then the Grizzlies get him late, I thought was a steal. Um, especially, you know, the defensive upside of him and Jaron Jackson. Um, I think it's a great fit with Jaron because Jaron could step out and shoot threes at the five, but he can also um, obviously protect protect the rim as well. So you've got these two uh, elite rim protectors on the floor at once uh, without sacrificing necessarily the shooting um, because Jaron can step out and shoot the three. Uh, and then the lob, lob throw in, John Morant, who can uh, get those guys out in transition. So was super excited for the landing spot uh, for Brandon Clark in particular. Um, don't quite get the Hawks hate. A lot of the draft Twitter folks have, have been hating on the, the Hawks draft, mostly because they weren't big fans of either Hunter or Reddish. I thought it was fine because, you know, DeAndre Hunter to me is a ready-made NBA player who can be a rotation wing, and he might be better than that. But at worst, as Sam Vecini says, he's like Damari Carroll. And maybe that's not great value at four, but I think it's pretty decent value, especially in a draft that is not that deep. Um, and then Cam Reddish, you know, is, is high an upside as there is in this draft, not named Zion Williamson. Um, you know, take a shot. You've got multiple first round picks. Um, see what happens because you already have this nice core of John Collins, Trey Young, Kevin Herter, DeAndre Hunter. Like those are those are four guys I think you can say are probably going to be NBA starters. And already are in, th- in in the case of all of them, but Hunter, you might as well take a risk. And I thought Hunter, I, I thought Reddish was the nice mix of risk and not completely um, like it wasn't a bull bull risk. Yeah. Worst. I think Cam Reddish can be trotted out like he was a Duke and just have him shoot. Yeah. So I think it's better going, going back to, to a, a brain clock for a minute. I think it's better that he's not on a contender 
because they're going to be more willing to experiment and kind of see how they can maximize them. And I think you mentioned him, him and Jackson together. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, but like Minnesota at a, at eleven before they traded up, I thought you know he could fit well with Towns. Um, didn't didn't make a ton of sense with Charlotte or, or uh, Miami. I didn't think, but Boston you know could could be really interesting because they they already have so many wings and and they're kind of um, prioritizing like this this multi you know this uh, switchability on, on defense and, and and Clark would be the ultimate um, kind of cog to to throw in there at center for them. Um, and then in terms of the Hawks, I mean, I, I think one reason why, why, why draft Twitter didn't like it was they filled out their lineup, right? Like they didn't care too much about like best player available um, or, or like the red flags with these guys, right? They, they had a one and a two in young and herder and they got a three or four in, in a four, you know, and, and, and Hunter can play some three, like like Collins can can play some four, um, but I think they they drafted to a complete their starting lineup, um, which I'm okay with. I think you know when when you've hit on mid mid first round picks like with Kevin Herter and with John Collins, um, can really speed up your your rebuild. And I I like that the Hawks went this way instead of like the 76ers way where they drafted Nerlens, then Embiid, right? That's that's fine, and then when you draft Okafor, then it's then it's too much, right? Then it's like you're you're taking this best player available thing way way too literally. And I, I just wanted to mention that the Hawks got got uh, Bruno Fernando at number thirty four, which was a great great pickup for him, a, a buy low there who can come off the bench um, and give them some minutes at center. And then I I understand all the red flags with with Cam Reddish, but who else were they supposed to draft? I mean, Sekou would have kind of doubled up with Hunter, right? That's kind of overlap there. Like, do you reach for Tyler Harrow? Um, like, they wouldn't want them to take Romeo Langford. I mean, like, like, who are they supposed to pick? Yeah, no, I'll buy that. I thought, you know, for me, like, if I'm the Hawks, like, people are saying, oh, you overpaid to go up and get DeAndre Hunter. Like, why not just wait? Um, even if he's gone, Culver probably would have been there. Um, or if not, you just get Reddish and then Clark. Like, that was the argument of draft Twitter, basically. And I think if you're if you're the Hawks, like, you've got all these assets. They're not, like, they're, you can't just keep, you know, punting them down the line. You have a young core that's cheap. You also have, you know, salary cap space to go get a guy uh, if you want to get a good a good wing um, or maybe even a big. Uh, like, you've got salary cap space. You've got, you've got a couple of players you want in this draft. What's the point of hoarding all this draft capital just for the sake of hoarding it if you have a guy you want at eight in deandre hunter if that's the guy you've chosen and like you can disagree that you don't think deandre hunter was the guy but if you think deandre hunter's your guy i don't have any objection with going up the four spots even if you gave up way too much to get get it because you wanted that guy if if you're gonna if you're if you're gonna hoard your just because oh this is not the right deal like i'm gonna stick it out and get stuck with the guys like no you're building a basketball team it's not fan- like this isn't I think people sometimes get too divulged into the game. Like at some point you're building a basketball team. Atlanta needed a 3-4 who could shoot threes, defend and not need the ball. DeAndre Hunter is a 3-4 who can shoot threes, defend and not need the ball. He's exactly what you need. Go get it. Like I don't understand why it was it a problem that they gave up oh no, they gave up 30 they gave up a good second round pick and number 17 to do this. Oh, I can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? Yeah, because I mean, like the, the one thing that you could kind of point out about this new Hawks team is that they could use like a rim protecting center, but like who, who, who can't, right? And they could use like one more guy who can get their own shot. Well, those guys aren't there. Like you could, like if if you want someone who can get their own shot, you could take Romeo Langford. I'm sure they would hate that pick. You know, the the uh, commenters. Um, you, know, you could do an incredible reach for like Carson Edwards or Kevin Porter, um, but I mean maybe they would like the Porter pick, but they certainly wouldn't like Carson Edwards at number eight. You know that's not a great use to your value. And then with with that trade, if if the Hawks still had the eighth pick, right? Hunter's going fifth. The uh, Cavs definitely would have taken him instead of Darius Garland, I think at least. Um, so y- the Hawks are taking Reddish at eight. 
and then probably Jackson Hayes at 10. You make that that trade with New Orleans. As long as you like Reddish better than Jackson Hayes, you know, that's that's a great trade because the Pelicans can't can't take Reddish, right? They they already have you know all all these guys. I mean, I guess they could, but that the fit wouldn't have been as as natural, I think, as as taking a high upside guy like uh, Jackson Hayes. I, I mean, maybe Reddish would have fit there, but you have Ingram, you have Josh Hart, you have Lonzo and Andrew. So you know that's that's already kind of set. Um, and then their front court had that big hole. So I thought that, that the move you know worked worked for both sides there. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I thought it was a very mutually beneficial. The, the Pelicans are in a spot where they're still trying to get assets. The Hawks want to start winning, and, and that's, that's quite all right, um, I thought, overall. Um, though I thought there were some nice second-round values in this draft. There were some guys that went undrafted that I was surprised by. Uh, I thought this year was really the peak of the um, dictated draft in the second round where guys were like, oh, don't draft me. I'm trying to go undrafted um, Could it, because, because they want to negotiate. All these teams want to negotiate two ways um, for, for guys who are drafted. I also thought it was really awesome to see a lot of mid-major guys get drafted. The thing is, like, like as, we, as we've as we said, sometimes getting drafted isn't the better thing. Like, for me, if I'm Zach Norvell, I'd much rather sign a two-way with the Lakers where, like, I would bet dollars to donuts that Zach Norvell is going to wind up being on the Lakers and being, like, a rotation player this year. Especially if they sign another max guy. Like, they just don't have, the play- they don't have enough players. Whereas, like, if you're Justin Wright Foreman and Mia Aoni, who both got drafted 10 picks apart on the Jazz, like, it's unlikely that both guys get a roster spot. So, I mean, like, I think the balance is, like, there's a balance there. I thought it was just really cool, though, just in terms of the moment, to see you know, Justin Wright Foreman, Jer- Jer- Jarrell Brantley, Mia Aoni, Justin James, Cody Martin, Jalen McDaniels, all the way up to Ja and Brandon Clark and... Um, and, and the Gonzaga guys, Rui, like just to see so many major guys get picked was, was really fun. I mean, it obviously sparked the people on Twitter. Oh, go where you're wanted. Like it doesn't matter. Um, I love all the tweets. Whenever, whenever something good happens to a major player, it's go where you're wanted. Look how many mid major stars came out. But, you know, I thought, in, I thought in general, it was a really cool moment to see some of those guys get picked. I thought the, uh, the video of Jordan bone. Have you seen that, Brad? I have. That was a really cool one. That was that was that was an awesome draft moment. So I just have a few kind of uh, miscellaneous draft takes here. Start starting with Jordan Bone. I mean, I've I've loved Jordan Bone um, since since his sophomore year last year. For for the for the Nets to take Jalen Hands over Jordan Bone, Jared Harper, Shamori Pons. I mean, that's that's just absurd. And I know that a lot of those guys, you know, may, as as you mentioned, you know, maybe didn't didn't want to take the two way or whatever. Um, but Brooklyn's a team that's chasing max guys, so so maybe they'll, you know, you'll be able to make that team. And if Jordan Bone took a two way with the Pistons, which I believe I saw that, that was reported, I mean, how, how how do you take Jalen Hands over Jordan Bone? I mean, that's that's a small thing. Um, moving up the draft, Bull 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 the forty four. That was ridiculous. Someone needs needs to take a swing. I mean, Denver to to have a team that's as as well stocked as as Denver's right now, and what they did with uh, Michael Porter last year, the uh, reports are that Porter's going to be ready to go this year. For them to be able to do now, now do the same thing with a uh, ball ball. I mean that that was an absolute steal for them. Next, I want to touch on the Warriors with Alan Smelajic, um, which a lot of people didn't know about, but he averaged nine points a game his center for their G League team, but he wasn't eligible for the draft. So this was the first year he was eligible. And the Warriors were going to move heaven and earth to get him at 41. Instead, the Pelicans steal him because like, it already leaked that they were going to draft him. Forcing Golden State, for some reason, to pay all this assets to get him, um, which I found really weird. So he, he had better pan out because they, cause they paid a lot to get them. Um, I love the, the, the Eric Pascal pick for Golden State. Um, but the um, Jordan Poole at 28, that was, that was a strange pick because I – like Jordan Poole as, as a prospect, I think if he stayed one more year, he, you know, he would probably establish himself in this range. But, I mean, he was completely off the radar uh, to go at 28. That was, that was very surprising. Um, I love the Carson Edwards pick for Boston. They, they need someone who can create. I do wish that they kept the Ty Jerome pick because I, I, 
I love Ty Jerome. I think he's going to be a better version of Landry Shamit, who had a great rookie year. He doesn't have like the lift times jump shot like Shamit does. I don't know if he's the same athlete, but I think he's he's a superior player. Um, very, very surprised to see Naz Little fall too, because like, what are the Thunder doing? I mean, taking Darius Baisley over Nazir Little, there's like, I mean that that just made absolutely no sense. And then on the Darius Baisley point, the people who say that this was a success for Darius Baisley, I mean. That, that's that's absurd because it was a success based on the hole that he dug himself into, right? Like he says he's going to go play in the G League. He then backs out, says he's going to train. Everyone mocks him in the 50s of their draft, and he ends up with the intrigue moving up to 23. But this guy was a top 10 recruit at the most scarce position in the NBA, a, a position that every team needs. We just saw Atlanta you know, give up all these assets to take an, an old – guy at, at this position with, with very little upside in a DeAndre Hunter. I mean, there's no reason with even a normal season, Baisley can't play himself into the top 10. Um, so to uh, say that this was a win was absurd. It was avoiding the worst possible outcome. Um, it was a solid outcome for Baisley. It also makes me wonder, you know, Oklahoma City did this with Josh Hustis, um, and you know, they, they didn't give Hustis a contract his rookie year. The, the first first-round pick American-born that they sent into the G League without a contract. I wonder if if, if, if Baisley gets the same treatment because they are hurting on the money end, but you know he does have the powerful Rich Paul as his agent. And those those I, I, actually one more take. Sorry, I was rambling, but I have I have one last take. Chuma Okiki at 16. I love him as a prospect. This was a horrible pick by the Magic. I mean, how is he going to get on the floor? Yeah, I mean that was that was such a weird one. Just the timing of it, right? Like. Like that was I I guess the argument could be if you think he's your guy, don't try to trade back and have him get taken out in front of you. Like the difference between like sixteen and twenty five, which is like the earliest you could have probably seen Chuma get taken. Like, whatever. But yeah, I mean, with their with with, with the way they're loaded up front, unless they're planning an Aaron Gordon deal, I don't know. I just I don't buy it. I mean, he's so good. I think I think he makes a lot of sense for the Magic. He's a smart basketball player, but. Yeah, I, don't, I, I didn't quite buy it. Um, I thought you made a lot of good points. I agree with a lot of them. Um, even just like the little stuff, like the point guard stuff or the two ways. Um, just for note on, on Baisley, because I thought it was a very interesting point. He was 17th in the composite, 23rd in the 24-7 recruiting ranks. For him to go 23rd in the draft basically is a wash. If you want to work. I mean, I think the bigger question is how will he perform when he starts playing? Right, because I think the argument. So, so, so for me, the argument is, how good are you going to be when you get there? Because I don't care if you get drafted twenty third versus you know fiftieth. Like, if you if you if you stink as the twenty third pick, you'll be out of the league in three years. Just like if you stink as the the fiftieth pick, you get like a little more margin for error if you're the you know the twenty third pick, but it's not a lot. But the way Mitchell Robinson played after sitting out a year. If now Dar- Darius Baisley proves that he can he can do it without sitting out a year, I think especially given you know there's more more avenues to be seen now with the combine with AAU, could we see prospects you know just skip that college year or or even when you get to the the end of the one and done, could you see prospects say I'm not I'm not going to graduate high school when I'm 17 years old I'm going to play my AAU summer I'm going to then drop out of school. I'm going to train for a year, and then I'm going to go to the combine, test well, look good at scrimmages, and get drafted. If 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 it shows that you're gonna, it, it basically proves he's good right away, just like Mitchell Robinson was. Because I think that was the thing with both guys is they were both projects, and for them to come in and it, for for Robinson to come in and be productive as he was was impressive. I think that's when you start to be interesting, but I don't think the idea that the Baisley somehow like was a win for the system, as you said, it, it's ridiculous. Yeah, because. I mean, half half the battle for us college basketball fans already lost, right? Because player X, even if Darius Baisley stinks, even if he never plays a game in the NBA, the fact that he was just picked twenty third, and they themselves will say, "Well, I'm well, I'm better than that," right? Like he's proven that I can do this and get drafted. The difference between the two of us, why he failed and I won't, is because I'm better, right? So that's that's what they're gonna think. Fair enough. That's that's a fair point. 
Any other draft takes before we move on? Um, I like the Romeo Lane for pick for Boston. I think he's he he's being underrated, even if he never becomes a great shooter. Um, I thought Nikhil Alexander Walker would have been the ideal pick for that Magic team. Um, get another guy who can create in the backcourt, uh, who who can knock down shots. Um, I saw a lot of Samanich love, but then when the Spurs drafted him in nineteen, I I heard all these reports about how he's not ready to play. Um. In the combine, he looks fine. I mean, he's fluid. He can put the ball on the floor a little bit, and he can shoot. People worried about his toughness, but I think that'll, that'll be a fine pick for the Spurs. But they could have gotten him at 29, I think. Uh, Kelvin Johnson falling 29 was huge. That was a great pick for the Spurs. Um, that's, that's basically all I have. Um, I like Taylor, uh, Taylor Horn Tucker at 46, too. Yeah, no, I thought that was a win for the Lakers. Um, it's tough because it's just I don't know what they're going to do with him, whether he's a two-way guy, whether they're going to just try to give him a chance to be on the roster. Um, like It's kind of tough to see because he, he, he is more prospect than player right now. Um, like he's, he's just such an interesting physical package um, that a team like the Lakers might not be able to hold a roster spot for him all year. But, I mean, they got a top 10 upside play in the draft at 46. Um, and for a team that you know doesn't necessarily – I mean, they, they, they ideally would have been able to draft a rotation player, like a um, ready-made guy you, you can plug in, like um, maybe like a Shamori Pons, um, with like, like a guy you could bring in and I think immediately play as a, as a guard, I think would have made sense. Um, but, but, but to get THT, I thought it was very logical for the Lakers. And then one, one random second rounder that I was sitting on that I was very shocked didn't happen was Utah and Daquan Jeffries. Because they, they lose Crowder in the Mike Conley trade. They need that kind of stocky, um, kind of small ball foreman who's, who's physical. Um, I, I thought Jeffries would have been a, like a nice cheap kind of buy, buy low prospect for that. But the way, they, the way they draft, I don't know if any of those guys are going to make the team. You know, they might stash one and put two ways the other two. Yeah. No, I will. Uh, I will buy that. I thought that made sense. Um, Jeffrey was a guy who was surprised not to get big. Same with Terrence Davis. Um, I think Davis was a guy who had a two way, uh, who could have taken a negotiated two way and didn't. Um, but yeah, um, it was it was it was it was pretty flooring um, to see some of those guys. I was also interested with Jonte. I guess the oh, yeah. thing is, there's no rush to sign him right now because he's not going to play summer league because he's not healthy. But I mean, to to see him fall like this was was certainly sad because if he's a legit. I mean, he's legitimately awesome. I mean, the talent is there, the work ethic, um, you yeah, know, the, the the skill set. I mean, everything's there. Like uh, Luke Luke King, not not getting drafted. I mean, if he stays for a sophomore year, he's hundred percent getting drafted. I saw Luke King reports were that he's very childish during uh, workouts. Wow, but <laughs> and then with the Terrence Davis thing, yeah, he tweets, "Oh, I'm not going to take a two-way." Blah blah blah. He then goes to the Nuggets. Which they don't have a ton of space for him, so he well, might have been just better off taking a spot two. though. If he just took a summer league spot, yeah, because some of the guys have been wanting to keep their options open. Like they just go play for a summer league team where they know they'll, they'll get minutes and play well, and then someone will sign them. Like I know Jared Harper went that route. Like he didn't want to commit. Like guys could have committed to two A or committed to exhibit tens, and they'd rather just because they think the exhibit ten will be out there. Basically, the Kenrich Williams bet on yourself route. Yeah, but I mean Harper going to Phoenix was one of one of the more ridiculous ones because they have Elia Kobo, Ty Jerome, and D'Anthony Melton, who they've all drafted, um, right there. The um, Nuggets one is different because they don't have any rookies. I mean they have Michael Porter, um, but he'll he'll be playing three and the four. Jared Vanderbilt will will be playing the four and the five. So there's there is opportunity for for Davis there to play um, and, and kind of make any of the teams. So I I guess that one wasn't crazy, but. I would I would be surprised if he makes the Nuggets. Yes, I don't think his goal is to make the Nuggets, but it was it was interesting. I mean, all these guys are it's, it's all strategy with their agents, and some of it's going to blow up in people's faces. But you know, it's worth a shot. Everybody's got a different different path to the league. Um, shall we move on to Gonzaga with uh, with our good friend R- Ryan Woolridge, who's off to uh, be their starting point guard? Yes. So. So I think this makes them a top twenty-five team for me. I I'm like seventy thirty right now for top twenty-five. Um, they get, I mean, the just just the upgrade from Woolridge 
uh, from AIE to to Woolridge is pretty huge. Their their lineup makes makes a lot of sense. I think I think that they're top twenty five. Yeah, I think you got to rank them. If nothing else, just because of the, I guess the 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 the, the WCC bump basically of you play in a league where you're going to rack up wins. So, like, even if they're 50-50 as a top 25 team, they're going to feel like one. I think what's going to be really interesting is Woolridge and um, and Gilbert fit really well together because Woolridge is, like, lightning quick slasher-type guard who can who can really pass. Um, he gets to the rim. He's a good finisher, um, but can't really shoot. Um, like, the, the 33% from three on, you know, 0.7 makes a game is not horrible. But the 58% from the foul line is really concerning um, in terms of his shooting upside. But, I mean, he's a guy, he, he rebounds, he passes, he also gets steals. I mean, he had, like, over 30 steals um, this season or so, something close to that. You combine him with Admin Gilder in the backcourt, that could be a really good defensive backcourt. Two guys who get into you, um, really defend, um, dig down. I think that, that that's, a, that's a nice defensive backcourt. I think it's pretty clearly the best starting two. I don't think uh, Brock Rabbit is going to start there. Um, without something crazy happening, without him you know, really outplaying his recruiting ranking. Obviously, it gets interesting from there. Um, the exciting thing is we'll get to see a lot of these guys play um, in the next next couple of weeks at, at DBU 19 um, because I have down playing Joel Ayayi, um Martinez Arlauskas, Umar Ballo. Um, all those guys are playing, plus... Um, uh, excuse me, Julian Strother um, will be playing as well, who's their 2020 commit. So we're going to get a chance to see a lot of their guys, um, which I think is really fun. Isn't Anton Watson playing too? No, he did not make the he path, did not unfortunately. Make I like I, him a lot. I should have pulled the list. But yeah, I mean, I, I think you definitely rank him. Um, I think t- the top 15 love is going to be a little um, little crazy just because Woolridge, I, I don't, I mean, unless this team is really going to be dominated by its front court, like, like, what would have to happen for you to make them, like, a top 15 team, Brad? Like, who has to take a step? Well, I mean, I, I might move them that high. Because in, in doing these rankings, two, two teams I had in that range, Alabama and Florida State. Alabama, I definitely want to move down a little bit. Because I thought Herb Jones was, uh, was at, at a higher level than he currently is. Same with MJ Walker at Florida State. So those, those are two guys doing these... Player these uh, positional rankings where I you know think in my head all right MJ Walker will probably be in there check his stats ooh wait I thought he was a lot more productive last year than this same same with Herb Jones those th- those were you know maybe the two biggest ones for me and I think I'll move both those teams from like 13 14 down to like 18 19 ish um, so those those spots in that 13 to 15 range are there for the taking um, in terms of who would need to take a step. I mean, Gilder's good. Woolridge is good. Tilly, m- more offense from him, not just as like the spacer. I think Petrusev uh, could 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 make like an incremental gain. I think Watson, and Timmy are going to be good. Um, Kispert's a guy who I've seen a lot of love for. I don't. I I think he's a good fit on this roster. I, I just I don't see him as like a you know upper echelon small forward at all. As as we'll see in a few minutes with my rankings, but. Um, I think that they have potentially a really strong nine-man rotation. Um, so, so the depth is there, and I think having a legitimate point guard and then having Gilder and Tilly as as your leading scorers, I think that's that's enough to maybe rank in the top fifteen. Yeah, I mean, I think it's reliant to be on having a really good front court, and then having one guy in the backcourt step up of like Arlovskis, who I've been told is like a like a two-three who can hit, create a little bit. Uh, Rabbit and then Ayayi. I think if if like two, if you get one to two of those guys, be like very good um, rotation players, um, which I'm pretty confident will happen. And then the front court just can dominate the glass. And I mean, Trusev could really take a step. Timmy's really good recruiting wise. Ballo's got a ton of upside. Zakharov's good. Uh, Ballo's really young. I think he's like a 17 year. I think he's like a 2002 birthday. Like he's really young. Um, so that'll be interesting. He's another guy I'm going to watch for. I think he's playing for Molly in the. Uh, the U19, I have a, a document on my website uh, for those listening 
uh, cbbcentral.com is the first um, first 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 story um, that has all the, the players. So um, definitely pull that up if you're following U19 over the next couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, I mean it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. The front court will be really good. Kisper just lost in this at perfect like three and D small forward. Um, maybe Orlovsky just takes a minute there. He maybe takes him with the two. Um, that court should be fine. Yeah, I mean I think I'll rank them probably around that that 15 range. I think that's probably the right spot for them. Uh, now that they have Woolridge, I think, you know, he's one of those guys where I don't think he can be the best or the second best or even like the third best player on a good, on a, uh, on a high level team. But as long as he can just run a team and, you know, fit or fill a role, which he obviously can do, you know, he's, he's got a pretty solid assist to turnover ratio. Um, he obviously racks up assists. He can get steals and blocks. Uh, and he was a, this year was a 60 steal 10 block guy. I mean, that those guys don't come, um, don't go, don't grow on trees. Uh, he's good at the rim. I thought this was a, a very important ad, more so than a high impact in terms of his playing ability. So I think they're a top nine for next year. Um, I think I would go Woolridge, Gilder, Kispert, Tilly, Petrasev as the starters. Um, and then Watson at six, Timmy at seven, Arlauskas at eight, Ayayi at nine. That, that would be my, my top nine. Yeah, I think it just depends on who can be the backup point guard. Like, if Barlowskis or Gilder can do that, then that's fine. If not, you probably have to include Rabbit. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, they're fine. They're in good shape. Um, we, we touched on FIBA U19. Just wanted to bring up, uh, did I, you track how many right you got for your prediction? On the roster? Yeah. I did not. I don't even know if I have mine written down because it was very... It came up at the last second. So I got nine right. The which, big, the big surprise was Isaac Legley. Yes. Yeah. I didn't. I. I have nothing to benchmark mine off of. So we'll say nine out of twelve was good. Um, but yeah, so I. I said the three guys who I had making the team that didn't were Samuel Williamson, Romeo Weems, and Justin Moore. Uh, Justin Moore, they say was hurt, but I don't. I. I don't think he would have made it anyway. Williamson was one of the last cuts. He made the second cut. Didn't see anything about Romeo Weems either being cut or being on the team, so I I, I don't even know if he was there. Um, but he was on the U18 team, or, or the U17 team last year. That's why I included him. Um, but so instead of those three, Isaac Likely from, from Oklahoma State, their starting point guard as a freshman. Um, Zaire Williams, who is a top 10 recruit. He's like a like really skinny, like scoring small forward. Um, and then the other one is Jalen Suggs, who's like a super athletic Defensive stopping combo guard. Uh, Suggs was also on the U17 team last year. I just couldn't really fit him into my roster. But so, rounding out the, the roster, um, Kira Lewis, Tyrese Halliburton, Cade Cunningham, Reggie Perry, and Evan Mobley. I think that'll be the starters. Uh, Lewis, Alabama's point guard. Halliburton is like the super glue guy, kind of point guard type for Iowa State. Cunningham and Mobley are the top two recruits in 2020. And Perry is Miss. Mississippi State's power forward, who they said played exceptionally well. Um, then the other four guys who I come off the bench, Jalen Green, who was another top recruit in 2020, as is Scotty Barnes. Barnes more of a 3-4, Green more of a 2-3. Uh, Jeremiah Robinson Earl, who's a perfect uh, new age center uh, for Villanova, going to be a freshman. And then Trivia Williams, um, whose who's coach is on staff, um, and, and they needed like a big big bruising center. So he gets that, that role as a Purdue's I think technically their backup center really behind harms. It is pretty interesting. Only one 2019 guy, the way it works out. Just the, cause you get the five, basically all the, the eligible college guys made it. Um, the like Halliburton likely, um, Perry Lewis and Trevion Williams, those five guys. And then Robinson Earl is the only 19 before so. 20. So, um, so that's pretty interesting. Um, I also am excited to watch, um, just kind of quickly touching on U 20. Um, as we go through this, we'll get a look at a couple of Virginia guys um, in Cafaro and Cody Statman. Uh, Cafaro for Argentina, Cody Statman for Virginia. Um, so that, that'll be interesting. I don't think either necessarily projected starters on this Virginia team, um, but both will have a chance for minutes. Um, St. Mary's duo from Australia as well, Kyle Bowen and Alex Dukas. Maybe those guys wind up in the rotation. Um, Francisco Farabello from TCU playing for Argentina. A.J. Lawson among the Canada contingent, along with Tyree Samuel, Joel Brown, uh, Jacoby Neath, 
uh, Jaden Bediaco and um, Damian Squire. Those guys all in college playing for um, a few high majors. Uh, Samuel playing at Seton Hall, Brown at California, Jacoby Neath at Wake. Um, so there's so some guys there. Michael Wong, who who blew up for Penn um, in that game they beat Villanova in. Uh, he's playing for China. He could have like a Rui-like tournament where he just dominates the thing as like a four. Um, as you mentioned, Arlauskis is playing. Who else is of note? Uh, the Mali team has a really good, int- real, really good and interesting front court with uh, Umar Balo from from Gonzaga and then uh, Kareem Koulibaly from from Pitt, uh, the 2019 recruit, as well as a pair of uh, wings who are committed to St. Peter's twins and uh, Fusaini Drame and Hassan Drame. Um, so that's interesting. AJ Edu, a sleeper from the Philippines, playing for, who, who's at Toledo, averaged like two blocks a game as a freshman. Um, Puerto Rico team is a bunch of 2020 guys that are interesting. And um, Andre Curbelo, Julian Strother, Victor Rosa. Um, the Canada team is some 2020 guys in 2021s as well. Kareem Mane, who's like a top 30 recruit now um, in terms of 24-7, but still has to catch up in the tw- composite. Keon Ambrose Hilton, Matthew Alexander Moncrief. So there's a lot of guys to evaluate um, beyond just the Kentucky guys. I'm very excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for, for Argentina because – Cafaro could be Virginia's like second or third leading scorer potentially if he lives up to the the height. Um, he's a like a traditional center, like a back to the basket scorer type. And th- they'll also have Farabello, who could be TCU starting point guard. And TCU, I think that they're going to be the worst team in the Big Twelve, but they have a lot of veterans. Um, you know, they could surprise. The uh, Big Twelve is is very condensed in the middle and bottom tiers. Like there's very little separation between the teams, um, but yeah, so it's it's going to be a really a really fun event that starts I believe next Saturday, um, and the USA should should win going away. Um, if if they lose again, you know, in a back to back years, that'd be a big issue. Yeah, I mean, this Canada team is not nearly as good as the teams that hired R.J. Barrett, Lindell Wigington, Abu uh, Kijab, um, Amadou Bamba from Coastal Carolina, Prince Oduro. Danilo Juracic, who's a starter for Harvard. Um, Noah Kirkwood, who's also at Harvard. They had some dudes. That was a really good team. So I don't expect Canada to do the same. Um, but, no, I mean, it, it'll be fun. There's a lot of guys to watch, and it's basketball, right? I mean, there's nothing else to do. Absolutely. Do we want to touch on small forward rankings? Yeah, we can run through them a little quicker than we have the last couple, but we should probably get to them. Okay. Small forward rankings – there was no separation between two and 30. I think Jordan War is clear number one. After that, I mean, I had no idea where to put anybody. I went with Scotty Lewis at number two uh, from, from, from Florida. Desmond Bain at number three. I thought that was a clear top three for me, I guess. Um, any other guys that you would throw into that top tier? I think he way, way underrated uh, Oche Agbaji to the point where I was going to have him top five. Oh, really? Yes. Partially because I'm bullish and I think he's going to break out even more. But, like, I think in comparison to some of the guys you have above him, especially, like, I, I guess for me, I don't understand the difference between Agbaji and, and Khalil Whitney right now. Like, I think if anything, Agbaji is a clear, like, role. That we know he's gonna play. He already averaged, you know, eight and five on a on a on a top twenty team, and you know it was clearly flashed even more brilliance. I thought for me, I mean, I guess his numbers weren't quite as good as I recalled them being, um, especially his shooting. But we we know he can shoot. Um, he's very athletic. Has has tons of upside. Had you know twenty four and seven against Texas, twenty three and six against Oklahoma State, efficiently twenty and eleven against TCU, like. When he had to play, he was really, really good. And I think, like, especially given who you're putting him up with, I thought he was a guy that had to come up quite a bit into that top tier. I think, you know, having him behind Lindy Waters, to me, is is pretty absurd. I know Lindy's just a, like, Lindy's just a shooter. Um, Mitch Bouch, a role player to me, like a very good role player, like a third option. Like, like Baji to me, I mean, top five team, like a definite starter, I thought he had to be higher. See, Igbaji for me, I mean, he really limped, limped to the finish. Yeah. Um, 
So the last like ten games, he scored in double figures twice, including a a zero point outing and three two point outings. So I'm not, not sure how much of that you know first stretch he had, um, you know, was just kind of like a flash in the pan or not. Um, but that was that was one reason, right? He he didn't shoot it great. Is you know I, I didn't read the article on the athletics. I don't have the athletic, but is is Kansas definitely going with the Silvio as a bookie? Front court, yes, yeah, they are. So I, I think he would be a lot better at, at the four, and they start Marcus Garrett with Isaiah Moss and Devin Dodson with Agbaji at the four. I agree. Um, he, he, he just feels more of like a natural four to me. I think at the three, he's going to be a little, little off, off kill. So that, I mean, he's he's very good prospect, but right, he he uh, had that that you know explosion for like three or four games, and, and like. The middle of the season, but I mean, a lot of these rising sophomores I have, have, I think, have just as much, if not more, more potential. I mean, like AJ Reeves had this same flash in the pan. Sadiq Bay, Aaron Neesmith. I mean, even even some of the guys I I, I have worked, like a like a Jules Bernard. Like I I wouldn't be surprised if like a Jules Bernard averages like fourteen or fifteen points a game um, as, as a sophomore, and and see like Baji average like you know nine and five, ten. Five. I don't know. I just get ten. I guess ten and five efficiently as a very good defender on a top ten team means a lot more than Jules Bernard's fifteen. Okay. Um, I don't so know. I mean, I, I I would argue for much higher. I think the reasonable shot should be like. I think it's tough for me to have him below twelve. Okay. I think I think you could argue for Mark Smith. And then from there, like I don't know, like, I don't, I don't think you can do Mitch Bat. Like I thought Reeves could be higher. Um, here's a guy I think you you underrated, Aaron Wiggins. I, I think he's more of like a two than a three. I mean, it's kind of it, 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 the three is the toughest position to 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 demarcate because oftentimes you're just playing with a three guard look. Um, I do this when I get in my rankings, but I thought Aaron Wiggins. I mean, betting on the upside, um, definitely to me could be higher up into that that top ten. Little things, I think, like, I think Mustafa Heron has to be higher than C.J. Ellaby. Just because, like, Heron's done the exact same stuff that Ellaby has done on a better team and done it more. Yeah. Unless you're betting on a huge year from Ellaby. I mean, they don't have Robert Franks anymore, so, I mean, he's he's their guy. Um, but I, I'll, I'll swap those two because, all right, yeah, so that was, that was my top three. And then I saw, like, an, I guess four to eight. Um, Khalil Whitney at four, Quentin Rose at five, Najee Marshall at six, CJ Ellaby at seven, Mustafa Heron at eight. And now, like Whitney, we don't really know, right? He's probably going to start at the three for, for Kentucky. Um, big time recruit. Probably place of three, place of four. You know, if he can hit shots, he's going to be really important for them. He'll probably average double figures. Quentin Rose, really good player, doesn't shoot it great, right? But he's. Has has great size. He can pass. He can handle the ball. He he can create. Marshall, um, his game didn't scale up as cleanly as you would like, but I mean he he can really defend. He can play multiple positions. I mean he's he's a really good player, and especially coming down uh, toward the end of the year. Ellaby had a huge freshman year. Um, he's on the radar for the draft. Uh, Mustafa Heron had probably his, his worst season, but it was still fifteen and six with like forty. 40 percent three-point shooting um and 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 he'll take the the primary offensive role on a bad team this year too um so a lot of different ways you can go with it there but that was that was four through eight yeah no i I, i'll buy all those i think those all kind of belong in that top tier i think this is where it gets interesting though this back end because you're you're talking a lot more guys that you're betting on how they scale up because like oh yeah oh yeah between Agbaji, Neesmith, AJ Reeves, Sadiq Bay, um, Jordan Bowden, Wiggins, Dexter Dennis, you have it down to 23. Like, that is really tough. I mean, all those guys you're betting on how, how well they're going to look this year. And that is going to be very difficult to do. And so while a guy like Jordan Bowden, Ochai Agbaji, Elijah Hughes, you know, yeah, Sadiq Bay too. I mean, 
there's like there's no debate that they're going to see a bigger role on offense. A guy like AJ Reeves or Lindy Waters, I mean, their teams didn't lose a lot, right? Like like an Aaron Wiggins too. Um, what, so the I think while well, well you would target those guys as as high upside guys as you know as you know guys who could really take a step forward, you know, there's a chance that they just put up the same numbers on on a similar team. Uh, so that was that was tough to consider. Um, but I went Elijah Hughes at nine. He's 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 the best player on uh, Syracuse now. He averaged like thir- thirteen and five, I think, last year. Uh, he was he was one of the more surprising transfers. Um, I bet he'll average like in the sixteen a game range. Uh, Josh Green was a tough one to slot number ten with Terry Armstrong gone. I mean, he's like their lone like kind of true bigger wing, right? Um, like your Dylan Smith, your Brandon Williams, Max Hazard. I mean, they're they're smaller guys, more of uh, shooters. Um, so so Green ha- has a defined role. I could see moving Green up. Um, 11, Jordan Bowden, 12, Mark Smith, similar stats. Mark Smith could be the best player on his team. Bowden, it's going to be interesting to see how, how his game scales up. He doesn't strike me as someone, um, who would be a go-to scorer, but he, he was playing behind three NBA players on the offense. So, um, and and still average double figures, so he could certainly scale up too. And then I, I just moved Igbaji to 13, like we discussed, uh, earlier. Here's a question for you. Um, so you've got Scotty Lewis at two, Khalil Whitney at four, Josh Green at 10, Wendell Moore all the way down at 19. What's the divide there? Because I think all of them profile to have like starting roles on good teams. Um, I, mean, I haven't watched a ton of Moore, but he's in the same general recruiting range as, as those other guys. I mean, what what is the difference in your mind? I mean, I think Lewis is probably going to have the biggest scoring load. Is that how you how you, how you sorted it? it? Was basically I, who's going to score the most? I sorted it based on the percentage I thought that they play. Right, so I think that the the chance that Wendell Moore doesn't start or doesn't. Um, you know, play as as a big role that you would think is higher than Scotty. Like, like I think I think Scotty Lewis is the most surefire of those four freshmen to to play a big role, and he was the highest rated recruit. So I think he's he's clearly the top ranked of those four. Whitney, he was the second highest, and I'm pretty confident he's going to play you know 28, 30 minutes a game and be pretty productive. Josh Green was ranked. Right, Rated a little bit lower than, than than Whitney. I'm more confident that he's going to play. I don't know if if he'll have as big of a role in, in the offense as, as like a, a Khalil Whitney. So I put him at three. And then more. I mean, more doesn't shoot it. Um, and I think Duke, Duke has enough guys where I could see more. You know, playing 19, 20 minutes a game as opposed to 30. Um, I think more out of this whole list of 25 is the most likely to not average double figures. That's fair. I think the other argument would be who else is on Duke's roster? Like, if you look at Kentucky, for instance, Kentucky has the opportunity to play, you know, like, could Dante Allen steal minutes? He was, a you know, obviously absurd. Could Keon Brooks steal minutes? Could Johnny Juzang? Could they play two guards with quickly Hagens and Max, three guards with quickly Hagens and Max together? Like, I think there's a clear path for Khalil Whitney to get boxed out of minutes, especially if he's been playing well. Like, if you look at Duke, for instance, like, where are you finding the minutes? Jordan Goldwire playing more? Well, no, it would be Cassius Stanley, Alex O'Connell, and White. So it would, it would just come down to shooting, right? Yeah. I get that. I don't know. I so, guess I, so. So would you have me move Whitney up? Uh, sorry, Whitney down, more up, or both? The thing is, I literally don't know. Like, I think you have just as strong. Like, my my problem is, I have just as strong a case for Whitney at four 
and more at 19 as I do for more at four and Whitney at 19. And I don't know that, that either is wrong. I just think there's such a, it's, it's weird to have such a large gap. That's the, you know, the first comment of the section is there's no separation between two and 30. Fair enough. Fair That's enough. the first thing I said. Fair enough. It, I guess it was like when I was ranking all these coaching hires, which I did check out that on my website as well, cvbcentral.com, rank all 54 coaching hires that have been made so far. Um, I, I, I felt like all the the internal hires, like there was a ceiling as to where they could be um, comparatively. And I mean, except for like, I, I, I didn't find any of them to be slam dunk. So like there was a ceiling for them, which was basically around that 15 range. And they all kind of got mixed in between 15 and 30 depending on how much I liked it. I guess that's what you're doing. It just felt to me like maybe you would have went from like in the 25 list, like the 10 was the ceiling for the freshmen and the, the floor was like 18 and those five, four freshmen got dotted in there. I guess it would have been the way it would have been the way I would have kind of approached it um, in like a median outcome type of situation. Um, okay, so how about this? How about if I move Whitney to six, so I'd slot Quentin Rose and Najee Marshall ahead of them. Okay. So we'll start with that. I would be moving down like Mitch Ballack. Really? You're not a Ballack guy? I'm not a huge Ballack guy. And maybe it's just because I didn't, like, I guess when I watched Creighton, my eyes always darted to Tyshawn Alexander, and it always darted to, um, like, Zagorowski. I mean, Ballack, Ballack is what he is, right? Like, he's... He's like a nice, he's a nice like secondary ball handler, uh, you know, ball mover. Hit hits an outside shot when it's open. Um, good catch and shoot guy. Um, you know, doesn't really get to the rim. Like I don't know, I just I, I could see like it's it's tough because like Mitch Ballack to me is probably like, the median outcome of what we know Mitch Ballack to be. It's hard to say that Wendell Moore is for sure better than that. But it's hard for me to put all the freshmen below him, even though I'm pretty sure at least one or two of the freshmen will be better than him. I'm really talking myself in circles here. I know. Yeah. My thing with Balak is he shoots it really well. He's a really good passer. Smart player. He, he doesn't really guard, though. Um, especially when they play with the four. Uh, but I think, all right. So we have Whitney at six now. We have Lewis at two. Josh Green at 10. I think maybe move Wendell Moore to 16. So he's in between Sadiq Bay and Lindy Waters. Yes. Okay. okay. So that, that brings us to, to the next grouping. We talked about uh, Mitch, Mitch Balakwit. Who have at 14. I have Sadiq Bay at 15. Wendell Moore at 16 now. Lindy Waters 17. AJ Reeves 18. Aaron Neesmith 19. A lot of kind of upside guys here. Um, so 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 you're not a Waters guy. You said that you think he's just kind of a shooter. Yeah, I mean I don't I don't know what Lindy Waters did when I watched Oklahoma State that wasn't just shooting. I think he's a ball mover. Like he doesn't make makes make mistakes. But like to me, he wasn't a guy. Like the, when you watch Lindy Waters, you watch him because he was running off screen and taking, they're taking threes. And that was on a 12 and 20 Oklahoma State team that I think he was like he was their second he was their second best player, and he might be their third or fourth best player this year. Okay, so I'm I'm fine with moving Waters down. Do you do you like Waters more than a Neesmith? I'm guessing no. I like the idea of Neesmith more than Lindy Waters. I don't know that right now you can say that. I think with Neesmith's upside, you bet I would push Neesmith over Waters. I'm okay. 50, but I think I would. They okay, so games. Like the, uh, what was the game that I watched? He played really well in, in that game against Tennessee. That's what it was. The, uh, the overtime game. Yeah, he, I, I'm just looking yeah. at him. He's 24 and 6. He was really good. Really efficient, too. All right, the last group. Uh, 20, Jules Bernard. 21, Cam Augusti. 22, Aaron Wiggins. 23, Dexter Dennis. 24, Mason Jones. 25, Kamani Lawrence. 
Uh, Bernard, I think, could have a breakout, but I'm fine with moving him down. Um, he, I, I always liked him when I saw him. Um, Magusti at 21, going to Miami. He can he can really score the ball. Um, I would I would be fine with moving him out, but I think he probably averages like 14 points a game. Uh, him and Likes, that's a pretty pretty strong scoring backcourt. Um, he was kind of relegated to a bench scoring role with with Trey Young um, there earlier. Wiggins at 22, I thought he was going to be higher, but he averaged less points than I thought. He shot it worse than I I thought from the field. And then I mean they have great. Cowan, Ayala, and and Marcel. I mean, if he can play small ball four, I think that's probably their that's that's how they get their five best players on the floor. Um, but I'm I'm not sure what kind of jump he makes, right? Because they they bring a lot back and they have a few other guards in uh, Cyril Smith too um, off off the bench. Where you know, I could I could see him putting up the same numbers again this year. Um, and then Dexter Dennis is a guy who I've always really liked. Um, they're at 23. With a Teddy Allen gone now, I mean, maybe Dennis plays more four. Uh, and then Mason Jones, he's someone who the numbers were just too good, I, I thought, to leave off. Where I, I, I didn't realize he put up that, that strong of numbers. It was like thir- 13 and five with like really, a really strong three point percentage. And then K- Kamani Lawrence uh, won, won a very tight battle uh, for that 25th spot. I think he could have a breakout year, but I'm fine moving him off too, if, if, if you think that would be the right move. Yeah, yeah, I would. I, I think that's probably fair. Um, who are some guys you just had missing the cut? Because I'm just like kind of blanking on small forwards right now. I'm trying to decide if I like your bottom half more. Okay, so I, I had a list of about seven guys. Could be, could be six. Um, but uh, C.J. Bryce from NC State, Miles Kale from Seton Hall, Sakara Neem from Marquette, Isaac Okoro from Auburn. Patrick Williams from Florida State and Jalen Harris from Nevada, and then and then Mario Kegler, um, his his numbers didn't, didn't really hold up like I thought, so he was kind of in, in that list too. Yeah, no, I think you hit it. I think all the guys you have on there, I would take over the guys you listed. Cool. Yeah, because yeah, the last spot between Patrick Williams, Sakara Neem, C.J. Bryce, and Kamani Lawrence, I was going back and forth. I think uh, Sakara Neem is really good, but I think. I think Lawrence's upside is a lot higher. So, Agreed. Cool. And I'll uh, tweet this out tomorrow. As always, always good content from Brad. Um, hopefully get more people yelling at you on Twitter because that's exactly what we need. Uh, there's more fighting. It's been a fun weekend of, of debate on Twitter. Um, pretty needless. Listen, listen, I, I, I love arguing with people on Twitter about stuff that I think I'm right or at least I, can, at least I think I can prove I'm right. With these positional rankings, you can't. I mean, it's arguing in an echo chambered circle, right? Like, who's better, Desmond Bain or Najee Marshall? I mean, you could argue that until the end of time. So, right, and the what I've been doing with these, I've been I've been posting these and then just letting it out into the universe and not responding unless someone had like a positional clarification question. The other problem that you have is when you're arguing with someone. They usually, again, we've talked about this a lot. The, the other person probably doesn't know. Like, like if, if you rank Dexter Dennis at 24, let's say, and you get a Wichita State fan and you're mentioning, oh, you know, Dexter Dennis is so much better than um, Cam McGusty. Like, how, how, how much is, has, has the Wichita State fan watched Cam McGusty? In many cases, they haven't, which makes it very difficult. Yeah, and I mean, I haven't seen Cam McGusty play in over a year. Right. And, and over... Over a year ago, he was a like seventh man for Oklahoma. You know, like he was really good as a freshman. Oh, yeah, and it's it's just so it's so tough to compare these guys. But yeah, it's fun though. It's always fun. Um, on I'll say race. I'll say small forward was by far the shallowest position. Center is incredibly deep. My oh, yeah. my list of, of centers I haven't started ranking yet or or cutting, but it went to fifty seven. Um, and I was I was more a lot more strict with, with, with centers than I was with uh, any of, of the other position. I think in order of depth, it goes centers the deepest, power forward, because a lot of these power forwards are like small, small power forwards, uh, then, then point guard, then shooting guard, then, then uh, small forward. That sounds about right. Um, 
and when I do my mid major specific ones, we can kind of compare the uh, the gap. I think that'll make things pretty interesting uh, as well. I'm excited to do those. I'm excited to watch some basketball starting on Saturday. U19, as we mentioned, that'll be fun. Um, you guys are getting back on campus. I know CM is back on campus this, this weekend. Uh, Northwestern's back on campus. When does Providence get back? I, I have no idea. I think that they're there for, for Pan Am because the, the whole starting five is, is uh, trying out. Yeah, <laughs> that, was, I had that was such a ridiculous roster because four of the teams wouldn't send any players because of foreign trips. And mm-hmm. then Kamar Baldwin was hurt, and there's no big men. So they had to take like Tyler Weidman Jeff and Brosell. Jeffrey Brozell. Because, I mean, like, who else are they going to take? You know, because you couldn't take like Jalen Butts, you couldn't take Tyreek Jones. You couldn't take Theo John or Jace Johnson. And then guys like Yurt Seven aren't American. Sandro's not American. So it's like we have to go. Uh, a Khalif Young's not American. So, you know, they, they had to go with uh, graduates. Yeah. Craig Malinowski out there chugging. It'll be great. I guarantee he gets caught. <laughs> there's, there, there's no reason to have him on the team. Nah, it'll be fun. It's good for you guys because you get like a you basically get a fake international trip for your starting five. Cooley should Cooley should only play those guys together. He yeah, make he a should. second. He, yeah, he, he the uh, starter should be like uh, Miles Powell, Tyshawn Alexander, Mustafa Heron. Um, I, I, I don't know the roster in front of me, but like you can make an easy starting five with that. Even uh, with Al- yeah. Alpha, Alpha's the one guy you would have all had to start, but you make a starting lineup. Out of the other guys, and then you just let the Providence guys play as the bench. Yeah, I'm not sure all all five will make the team because um, three guys are getting cut. Uh, but you know, people complaining is not fair. I mean, Purdue took their whole team last time. Like, come on. <laughs> I got a te- yeah, I got a text. I think that counted as their international trip, though. Oh, really? I don't know. I could be wrong. But the, was- I mean, it was the the world world university games. But the Pac-12 had an all-star team for that. So that's true. I got a text from a. Uh, a coach, which was just so funny uh, afterwards. It was like, how did Cooley get this gig? And I was like, uh, it's because of all the uh, all the guys getting uh, get, having to go on their own international trips. And he was like, oh, it's still a sweet gig for Cooley. Because uh, he just gets to get work out of guys. So that's pretty fun stuff. Um, no international trips for either Northwestern or... Uh, actually, Northwestern is going on one. Northwestern is going on one, which will help. Um, the Fighting Pat Spencers. Let's get it, baby. Cool. All right, we'll wrap this one up. We will uh, talk to you guys next week with uh, with more analysis and get into deep dive season soon. As always, you know, chime in on Twitter. Um, when you have you know, teams you want deep dove on, we were happy to do them. All right, have a good one, folks.